You Should Meet Shirley Chisholm, written by Laurie Kalkoven and illustrated by Caitlin Shea O'Connor. Introduction Have you ever dared to dream when people said you shouldn't even try? Have you fought for something you believed in? Maybe you have a secret dream or goal that you think is too impossible to ever achieve. If any of those things are true of you, then you should meet Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman ever elected to Congress. She was also the first African-American person, male or female, to seek the nomination for President of the United States from either the Democratic or Republican Party, the two major political parties in America. Shirley didn't win, but she opened the door for women and for African Americans who came after her. A lot of politicians wanted Shirley to stay out of public life, but she wouldn't. She famously said, If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. When she was asked why she ran for president, she answered, Why not? Why not dare to dream? Once you meet Shirley, you'll be inspired to dare to dream too. Chapter 1. Brooklyn and Barbados Shirley Anita St. Hill was born in Brooklyn, New York, on November 30, 1924. Her mother was from Barbados. Her father was a factory laborer from Guyana. Times were hard for the family, and Shirley's parents wanted the best for her and her two younger sisters. When Shirley was three years old, they made the decision to bring the girls to Barbados. Shirley and her sisters lived on a farm with their grandmother, while their parents struggled to earn a living in Brooklyn. Shirley missed her parents, but she later said, Granny gave me strength, dignity, and love. I learned from an early age that I was somebody. Shirley went to school in a one-room schoolhouse. It was a strict school, but she learned to read and write easily. After school each day, she and her sisters did chores on the farm. They collected eggs from the chickens and ducks and fed the cows, sheep, and goats. Shirley learned to take pride in her work on the farm. When their chores were done, the girls also played and swam at the island's beaches. About seven years later, Shirley left the peaceful island for the busy streets of Brooklyn. It was the Great Depression, a time when many people struggled to find work, but Shirley's parents wanted their children with them. Her father worked in a factory and a bakery. Her mother was a seamstress and cleaned other people's houses. They were poor, but they were together. In school, Shirley was placed in a lower grade because she hadn't been taught American history in Barbados. She started to cause trouble in class. It wasn't long before her teachers realized she was bored and should be in a higher grade. From then on, she was a great student. Shirley's father loved to read. He read the newspapers every day and was always reading books. He inspired Shirley to love reading, too. He talked about politics at the dinner table and encouraged his daughters to be interested in government. Her mother wanted all the girls to go to college. Shirley graduated from Brooklyn Girls High School in 1942. Her grades earned her scholarships to top colleges, but those scholarships didn't pay for room and board. She decided to live at home and go to Brooklyn College. Chapter 2. College and Career Shirley studied sociology at Brooklyn College and thought she would like to be a teacher. She won prizes for debating. A debate is a formal discussion in which people argue different sides of the same question. Shirley's professors told her that her debate skills would serve her well in politics. When she graduated from Brooklyn College in 1946, Shirley began working as a preschool teacher. At the same time, she studied for her master's degree at Columbia University. She also met and married Conrad Chisholm. At home in Brooklyn, Shirley got involved in local politics. She joined Democratic clubs and worked to help black candidates get elected to local offices. Then, after years of helping other people get elected, Shirley decided to run for office herself. In 1964, she was elected to the New York State Assembly. She was one of just four women in the Assembly, and she worked to pass bills to increase funding for daycare and to help working people. Shirley was a success and won the respect of the people she represented in Brooklyn. 
it wasn't long before she began to think about a higher office, the United States Congress. Chapter 3. Unbought and Unbossed In the late 1960s, supporters asked Shirley to run for the United States Congress. A race to win a seat in the House of Representatives would be long and hard. Shirley wasn't convinced she should run. One night, a poor woman came to her door in Brooklyn and said she and her friends wanted Shirley to be their candidate. She gave me a dirty envelope containing $9.62 in nickels, dimes, and quarters, Shirley said. The woman promised to raise money every week, and Shirley promised to run. Shirley never had as much money as the men she ran against, but she ran a new kind of campaign. She spoke to the women voters in her district, something the other candidates never did. She also spoke Spanish to her Spanish-speaking neighbors and encouraged everyone to register to vote. She drove through her neighborhood in a truck and spoke through a loudspeaker. I'm fighting Shirley Chisholm, she told them. She wanted people to know she would stick up for them and fight for them and she asked them to vote for her. Shirley told the voters that she was unbought and unbossed. That meant she hadn't taken money from big corporations and that no one could tell her what to do. Unbought and unbossed became Shirley's campaign slogan or motto for the rest of her career, and she always made sure that it was true. Not only did Shirley win in the 1968 election, but she also became the first African-American woman elected to Congress. All of a sudden, she was famous. Everyone wanted to know more about her. Shirley made her mark right away by hiring an all-female staff to work in her Washington, D.C. office. The United States faced a lot of challenges in 1968. In that year, civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr., and presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy were both killed. The country was also fighting an unpopular war in Vietnam. The men in Congress expected Shirley to take a back seat. They expected her to be quiet and not voice her opinions. She was a newcomer and needed to pay her dues. That meant other representatives in Congress who had been there longer than Shirley got their requests answered first. But the woman who called herself fighting Shirley Chisholm was never good at taking a back seat. Representatives in Congress are assigned to committees, groups that work together on different issues. Shirley was assigned to the Agriculture Committee. There were no farms in Brooklyn, and Shirley asked to be reassigned. No one could believe that Shirley was making this request. Only people who had been in Congress for a long time got to choose the best committees. But Shirley didn't give up. She was finally reassigned to the Veterans Affairs Committee. There are a lot more veterans in my district than trees, she joked. That committee gave Shirley a chance to improve life for United States veterans, people who had served in the Air Force, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines. In Congress... Shirley worked to get more funding for daycare programs for children of working parents. She wanted equal rights for women, better health care, and greater opportunities for poor and working families. In her very first speech in the House of Representatives on March 26, 1969, she spoke out against the Vietnam War and promised to vote against bills that gave more money to the war instead of helping the people of the United States. It was because she fought for them that working people around the country supported Shirley in running for president. An African-American woman had never sought the presidential nomination from either the Democratic or Republican Party before. But that didn't bother Shirley. On January 25, 1972, at the Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, Shirley announced she was running for president of the United States. Chapter 4. Candidate of the People I am not the candidate of black America, although I am black and proud, Shirley said when she announced she was running for president. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman, and I'm equally proud of that. 
I am the candidate of the people of America. From the beginning, Shirley's campaign was an uphill battle. She had a lot less money than the men she was running against. Many people treated her campaign like a joke. Even though Shirley met with a lot of obstacles, she didn't give up. She didn't win enough votes in the Democratic primaries to be the party's nominee, but she became the very first African American woman to have her name entered as a nominee at the Democratic National Convention. The Democratic and Republican National Conventions are where each party decides on who their nominee for president shall be. The party also decides on a statement on what the president's goals will be should he or she be elected. This party statement is known as a platform. George McGovern won the Democratic Party's nomination and lost the November election to President Richard Nixon, who was the Republican candidate. Shirley believed that her campaign would make it possible for more women and more African Americans to run for president and to be taken seriously. The door is not open yet, but it is ajar, she said. Chapter 5 Dare to Dream after the election, Shirley got back to work in Congress. She continued to fight for the causes she believed in and to work with other representatives to pass laws. Shirley served a total of 14 years in Congress before she decided to retire in January 1983. She left Congress, but Shirley didn't give up the fight. She taught politics at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts and co-founded a political group for black women. She also remained active in the Democratic Party and worked on other candidates' campaigns. In 1993, President Bill Clinton asked Shirley to be the U.S. ambassador to Jamaica, but by that time, she was in poor health. She lived a quiet life in Florida until she passed away on January 1, 2005. The world continues to be inspired by Shirley. In 2015, President Barack Obama awarded her with the Presidential Medal of Freedom after her death, and in 2020, she became the first woman to have a public statue dedicated to her in Brooklyn. The 40-foot-tall structure combines a statue of Shirley with an image of the United States Capitol building. Seats around the statue will bear the names of women who have followed in her footsteps and been elected to the U.S. Congress. Shirley would be proud of those honors. She would be even more proud of the inspiration she became for women and men all over the world who dreamed of running for political office and thought perhaps they couldn't or shouldn't pursue their dream. Shirley Chisholm had the courage to dream. She had the courage to stand up for change. Now that you've met her, don't you think you can do the same? The End this read aloud has been brought to you by Time to Read to Us. Hit the subscribe button for more kid friendly read alouds. Thanks for watching!